Welcome to World Teach as we present Teaching and Living in American Samoa. We're super excited to be here tonight, so thanks everybody for joining us. We have a bunch of listeners on the line, um, so we're excited to start the conversation. So amongst our listeners, we have some new applicants, those that have just been accepted into the program, and others that are interested in learning more about World Teach in American Samoa, or perhaps just World Teach in general. So let's continue. All right, so let's go through our agenda for the evening. So first, we're going to introduce our facilitators and panelists. Um, we'll learn a little bit about their backgrounds. Then we're going to provide an overview of World Teach before jumping into the specifics of our American Samoa program, including our partnership with their Department of Education, their in-country partner down in American Samoa. Then we'll discuss the history and growth of this specific program as well as a brief outline of the application process, including a required standardized test called the Praxis One. From there, we will talk a bit about the American Samoa educational system in general, um, and then focus specifically on being in the classroom. So what sort of cultural challenges will you encounter? What is the current level of English amongst your students and co-teachers, or excuse me, co colleagues, the other teachers in the school with you? And what sort of resources will or won't you have in the classroom? After that, we'll be discussing living in American Samoa. What are the housing placements like? With whom will you be living? What is the monthly stipend? What will your commute to work be like? What do volunteers do during the weekend or extracurricular activities that they get involved in? Um, we'll get to hear personal experiences from our alumni that are on the line with us. And then at the very end, we'll be dedicating some time to questions and answers. So throughout the webinar, you can submit your questions through the chat function that you should see there on your screen. Be sure that you click the send question to staff and that it will come directly to us. So we have staff on the line that are ready to answer your questions. Um, and some questions we may actually wait to address until the end as a group. So just be patient. We will answer all of your questions. Um, so as people are joining us, because I think we've gotten a couple more people in the last few minutes, um, thanks for joining us. We'll be talking about American Samoa living and teaching in the Pacific. Um, so if you do have a question, just chat it in, raise your hand, and as we, um, excuse me, as we get to the questions, we'll answer and then perhaps we'll answer them at the end. So let's see, Isaac, I know you're having trouble with the hearing and no worries, we'll chat anything to you. Okay, so let's move on. So let's introduce our facilitators. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Brooke. I'm the Director of Recruitment and Communications here at World Teach in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I returned just last December from Columbia where I was teaching middle and high school. So that picture of me is with my sixth graders. They were pretty fabulous. But as you can tell from my bio, I don't really like eighth and ninth graders. But that's another story. Um, so I was teaching middle and high school and also training teachers in Columbia. I graduated from Emory University in 2007 and I worked in corporate America for a few years before leaving for World Teach and I have not looked back. Um, Kaylika, let me pass the mic to you. Let's introduce our my co-facilitator. Hi everyone, good evening, or at least it's evening uh, our time here in Cambridge. Um, I'm the admissions coordinator, as you probably already know. I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I didn't actually serve with World Teach, but I, I found it through a, a series of events, and uh, I haven't looked back. I'm about to be the uh, World Teach field director in Chuuk, Micronesia, um, and I'm definitely a testament to how uh, deciding to volunteer can really affect the rest of your life. Um, I did not expect to, to keep traveling uh, when I decided to be a Peace Corps volunteer, but it led me to India, and now it's leading me to Micronesia. So be ready to have your your life's changed if you sign up for a World Teach program. Uh, it really is an amazing experience. That's for sure. Your life definitely changes and absolutely for the better. It's hard to remember life, I think, pre-World Teach. 
and Kalika, we're very excited to send you to Micronesia, but we will miss you <laughs> dearly. Okay, so moving on to our panelists. We are so lucky to have two alumni from American Samoa joining us this evening. First, we have Drew Ross and also Quinn Bolander. So you will see that Drew was the field director. Prior to that, he was a volunteer in American Samoa, and Quinn was a volunteer back in 2011. So let me int- let me allow you guys to introduce yourselves. Drew, hello. How are you? Hi, everyone. Um, as Brooke said, my name is Drew Ross, um, and um, you know, going to American Samoa was probably the best experience I've ever I've done so far. Um, my one-year volunteer commitment uh, turned into three years in American Samoa. Um, after I was the field director, I stayed for another year on contract with the government um, and just returned uh, stateside this past uh, June, and I'm happy to help you guys. Fantastic. Hi. Yes, Quinn. No, go ahead, Quinn. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited that all of you are considering going to American Samoa. As Drew said, it was one of the best years of my life as well, and it changed so much about my own personal goals and career goals and things like that. So we're happy to help you in any way that we can um, with any questions that you might have about the program. Beautiful. You guys, thank you so much. Um, And let's see who's actually listening on the line. So we have about 20 guests, some of whom I think have are still, you know, in their way to joining up and listening to us. But um, of all the people that expressed interest tonight, we've got people listening from North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Texas, Alaska, Tennessee, Alabama, Oregon, New Jersey, Florida, Illinois, Georgia, New York, and even an attendee from Guyana down in South America and also Great Britain. So thank you guys so much for listening in. We're also very excited to announce that we have our field director, Isaac, from American Samoa on the line. It's actually 1 p.m. in the afternoon over there, so Isaac was kind enough to step out of school to help us. So, Isaac, thank you so much for joining. I know that the audio and internet in general is kind of a struggle, so we're just very, very grateful for your help. Um, We also have some prospective volunteers on the line and future American Samoa 2014 volunteers. So, thanks, guys for attending okay moving on so world teach who are we what are we so just a quick introduction to the organization Um, world teach originally started back in 1986 as a student-led organization through harvard university and now we are our own nonprofit organization with over 7,000 alumni and we currently serve in 16 countries So our mission explains a bit further um, that our work is changing both the community where we serve and the volunteer. So our mission statement is as follows, as you can see. World Teach partners with governments and other organizations in low and middle income countries to provide volunteer teachers to meet local needs and promote responsible global citizenship. So how do we do this? So we're mobilizing college graduates who have a a passion to empower underserved students through education. We give our volunteers the opportunity to become citizens of the world who feel responsible not only to their home country, but also to the global community. And we give students in the communities across the globe the educational tools they need to gain access to wider career opportunities. That's all, you know, very professional sounding. It's really about the nuts and bolts of what are we actually doing on the ground, the grassroots organization and action that we're doing with these communities. And for everything that we're giving to them, we're getting even more in return as individuals. So let's continue. Kalika is going to introduce a little bit about our volunteer application process. All right, so this is my speciality. Um, What we do need for the American Samoa application is we require a resume, um, a personal statement, and a college transcript. Once you go ahead and upload those, uh, we we process that. We'll review that on our end. Um, That typically takes about a day. Um, And then we'll get back to you, and uh, we'll let you know if we've let you uh, on to, invited you to the next stage of the application process. In the next stage of the application, we require two letters of recommendation. Uh, Your recommenders can write 
write just a one-page uh, general letter of recommendation for you, and that can be sent in uh, to us directly from either their email address or they can fax it to us. We also require um, an interview, and you'll interview with us either via Skype or phone. Um, and so I'll uh, be handling those interviews, or Caitlin Ivester will also be handling those interviews. She's taking over while I head off to uh, Micronesia. Our requirements for the program are that you be 21 to uh, 74 years old, and the cutoff at 74, unfortunately, it's just a, a, and for insurance purposes, and so that's why we have that uh, end age right there. Um, and then we also require that you be a fluent English speaker. Uh, in the American Samoa program specifically, we are teaching English, so that is a, a pretty heavy requirement there that you be a, a fluent English speaker. Of course, we take um, people who are not native speakers but have fluency in English, so um, if you are fluent, then you're good to go. Um, and we'll be evaluating some of that as well during the interview. We do require that you have a bachelor's degree, um, and specifically in American Samoa right now we are looking, the Department of Education has asked that we have people who have degrees in either English or liberal arts related fields. If you have a degree in another field, we still will consider your application, um, though we may need to talk a little bit um, and, and see if maybe there's another program that would be a better fit for you. But again, you're more than welcome to go ahead and fill that out for American Samoa, um, and we'll go ahead and talk as well during, during that interview process. Um, and we're also looking to, uh, just in general, for people who have a willingness to serve and, and to teach and be taught. Um, and I think, too, that mutual exchange is particularly important. We're looking for people who are open to the experience. They're flexible um, and they're patient. And uh, looking, at, I think, too, really just to have an experience that, that will change and impact their life. Um, and also, too, for program dates and deadlines, we do operate on a rolling admissions basis. We're accepting applications right now for American Samoa. It's been extended until June 16th. Um, and this is just due to the fact that we did have a request come in for uh, extra volunteers on top of what we were originally planning for. So we're looking to fill those extra spots that the Department of Education has requested. Um, the volunteers should depart. We're expecting the first week of August, and they'll return in July 2015. Fantastic. I also want to add that, um, as you know, things kind of happen in a different pace in a lot of these countries. So for a while, we were expecting that the school year was going to start in August, and that that's why originally we were sending people in July and for that reason we've changed the deadline because school has been confirmed to now start the first or second week of September, which means we're sending our volunteers a little bit later. You'll quickly learn that a flexible attitude is required because these things change and happen all the time. Um, okay, fantastic. Kilika, thank you so much. Let's go on to the next slide. So now we're going to get into specifics about the American Samoa program. So let's review the history of the program. Back in 2009, World Teach began our partnership with the American Samoa Department of Education to send about 20 volunteers to teach math and science because there was a shortage of, of skilled teachers there. Um, so our volunteers were and continue to be funded by their Department of Education. Since then, we've sent on average about 25 volunteers each year in high school placements teaching a variety of subjects including math, English, science, and business courses. Um, but now things are changing slightly. So with a new director in the Department of Education, the focus and strategies have shifted. World Teach has been requested to send 20 volunteers to teach English in public high schools. Many of the American Samoan English teachers have not, pra have not passed the Praxis 1 certification test, and that is a requirement for them to teach and be paid, and therefore they're unable to teach English, and this this is the reason why our World Teach volunteers are needed. So that Praxis 1 test that I had mentioned before, that's where we are coming into this again. So Praxis 1, what is that? Kaylika, you are my source on Praxis 1. All right. Glad to be of help over here in the admissions department. Um, and so with the Praxis 1, too, I just want to preface this before we dig into it. I want to let you know that we will be sending you uh, this information tomorrow in an email. So no need to frantically uh, take notes on this information. It is also available. We have some links on our website to more information about the Praxis. Uh, if after this, you can't wait until tomorrow and you'd like to look up some more information, that is available if you click on the American Samoa information page. A little bit about the Praxis. Um, so it's 
it's a, a basic test that's administered by the same people who bring you the GRE and TOEFL tests, um, and it's just going to measure skills in reading, writing, and math. Uh, some of the states require, English, or require teachers in general in the U.S. to pass this test for licensure, and some colleges and universities also use this test um, to qualify candidates. Some teachers may uh, have already taken this test, uh, or they may have some sort of licensure that may waive them for, from this. Again, you would contact the admissions department if you feel that you qualify for this, and we'll start a dialogue and see see what your experience, uh, what you have, and if it does qualify you to get that waived. You do need to take it, uh, and, and why you need to take it is because it's going to help us um, really help the American Samoa Department of Education uh, reach their teacher quality initiative. Um, and so we are asking, uh, they've set a, a score of 170 is what they're looking for as the, the minimum score for that. So you get a 170 or higher, and you must pass all three sections of that uh, test. Here, let me go on to the next page for you. Okay, and the benefits of taking the Praxis, if you're looking to teach again in the future, um, it's used uh, in the U.S. for many of our state certification programs, so it's definitely very useful if you're looking to teach again in the future, and even right now if you're not looking to teach again in the future, who knows if a year with American Samoa uh, may change your mind about that. So um, it's a good thing to have to put on a resume, um, and the test results from that as well are valid for five years, um, and so again, it's, it's you can keep it on your resume, it'll be good for those five years, and it's not that hard to pass either. If you do a little bit of studying, um, it really is the basics of, of what we do require people to know before they go in and teach. Um, you can go online to register for the Praxis at ets.org. Again, that link and more information is available as well if you want to click through on our website. You can find some preparation materials and some answers as well to just commonly asked questions. Um, the test is offered year-round at testing centers around the country, um, and it's both computer-delivered and paper-delivered. Those test dates for uh, how you take the tests are a little bit different, so look online to figure out uh, in your area what test is offered and what sort of dates are also available for the computer-based test and also the paper-based test. You must register at least three days prior to the requested test date, um, and spots may fill up sooner than that, so we're asking that if you are looking uh, right now uh, and you're in maybe that stage one of your application where you've submitted those documents to us and you're waiting for an interview, it's a great time to go ahead and look into registering for the Praxis um, and at least have a date in mind where you'd like to, when you'd like to take it. If you go ahead and then register once you're accepted, then you should be good to go. The test costs $135 um, if you take it for all three subjects, but there's some differentiation in the prices. If you look online, if you take it in different components, um, it could end up costing a little more if you don't just take all at once. Um, again, that information is available on the Praxis website. Um, and yeah, the, the general feedback in the past few years, um, as I've mentioned, is that the, the test is pretty basic. Um, it's simple and straightforward, um, and with the knowledge that you've acquired from getting your bachelor's degree, it should be fairly easy to pass. Um, a little tip that, that Brooke did look up was that uh, uh, since only correct answers count towards your score, it's not like the SAT. You can guess um, and you aren't penalized for your wrong answer. So that was a great tidbit that Brooke found there. Awesome. Kilika, thank you so much. Um, Quinn and Drew, do you guys have anything to add on when you actually took the Proxis one? Um, yeah, both Quinn and I did take it uh, when we were in country, and as was previously stated, it is a really simple, straightforward test. It's sort of like the SAT, you know, with that format, English, you know, writing, reading, and math. Um, I, at one point I heard it was sort of geared towards like a 7th to 8th grade information, so really there should be no difficulty. In the time that I was in country, um, overseeing Quinn's group and then my group, there were no volunteers who did not pass the test, um, so it should not be a problem for any potential volunteers volunteer. Awesome. Also, I, I think um, that what Drew said is exactly right. And I was an English student in my undergrad, and so I was worried about the math the math test because math isn't my strong suite, but honestly, it was it was completely fine. Having not taken math in almost six years, I was completely fine, and obviously, as you mentioned, everyone passed. So it's really nothing to worry about, um, so it shouldn't be a stressful thing for you at this point. Great. You guys, thank you so much. And that is actually, I think, good to, to hear because it's funny that for, or it's unfortunate that for us, it's not a problem. You know, this is something very simple that we can do. But the reality is a lot of American Samoan teachers cannot pass this exam. And that just shows the level of English knowledge over there. And that's, again, why we're going there, because there is a need. So I think that's kind of exact evidence as to why World Teach has been requested by the Department of Education there to help them.
So on that note, going forward, as I said, the Department of Education funds this program. They pay for each one of our volunteers, and it is because they have self-identified the need for us to be there to help them, clearly because of evidence like the Praxis One um, test. So the fact that they pay for us is huge. I cannot emphasize that enough. World Teach right now is in um, 16 different countries, and we only have, I believe, four countries that are funded by our in-country partner, whether that's the Department of Education or another organization. The majority of these countries cannot afford to pay for us, but they find the money because it is so important to have our help there. So what does this funding cover? Um, many, many things. Let's go through the list. So number one to begin with are visa sponsorship and work permits. And obviously these are all things that World Teach takes care of for you, which is pretty great. Um, this actually also covers round trip airfare. So this is between a designated U.S. departure city and American Samoa. So that means that let's say you live in Texas and that departure city is Los Angeles. That means that you have to get yourself from Texas to L.A. But once you're in L.A., that's where this money carries you from the United States to American Samoa. Okay. Also, our health and emergency evacuation insurance um, training, which is a huge, huge part of World Teach. So when you first get there, you'll have an orientation that lasts about three to four weeks. That includes teacher training and practicum, language and cultural immersion, safety and security, and all those things that you just don't know what's going on when you first get there. That's what we take care of for you. Um, additional training is mid-service conference and end-of-service conference. It also covers all meals and housing during orientation and these conferences, transportation between the training sites and your placement site, housing, your monthly stipend, which we'll continue talking about later, support from full-time in-country field staff, and then also your professional development through our teacher quality program, including mentorship from a remote teacher quality coordinator who is here in our Cambridge office. So that's something that we can get into later, um, perhaps in in detail through through another webinar, but that is when you're in touch with our teacher quality coordinator here in Boston to review lesson plans, talk about issues in the classroom, if you're having any questions, concerns, that's where they're, where they're there to support you. And at the bottom, you'll see, very important, we have a $2,000 deposit that's required for our funded programs. Um, this is returned in full upon completion of the program. So once you're at the, after your year has finished and you're back in the States or Canada or wherever you're coming from, that is when we give you your money back. And that is very important, right? Yes. Okay, moving on. All right, teaching in American Samoa. I'd say that this is the most important part of tonight's webinar. So we're quickly going to go through the educational system, and then I promise I will stop talking and actually turn this over to our alumni who can give much more specific examples of their experiences there. Um, so as you'll see on the screen, so we've got 22 public, public elementary schools in American Samoa that feed into five high schools. And again, we're going to be working at the high schools in American Samoa. Um, I'd say this is the most important part. English is the language of instruction. However, very few teachers actually abide by that. Um, Samoan is really used in the classroom until high school when they try to transition into English. But of course, that's a very difficult transition for most teachers and students. Um, an idea of the level of kind of academia there, you'll see that most principals in American Samoa hold a master's degree and most teachers hold a bachelor's or associate level teaching certificate. At one time, it was actually possible to teach with no education beyond a high school diploma, um, but because of recent changes in educational um, policy, so that has changed. Um, standards have been raised and now you do need actual certification, which is again why we're coming in, because there were people teacher, there were teachers that were teaching subjects like English that they weren't actually certified to teach. Um, and very important to note is that the American Samoa schools are indeed funded by the U.S. Department of Education because, as you know, it is a territory. Um, but the school system is, of course, very different, marrying more of a developing country, yet with American expectations. So that changes the dynamic completely. 
Okay, cultural challenges. I think this is really what we need to focus on, um, and this is what Drew and Quinn are going to get into. So, corporal punishment. In American Samoa, this is absolutely an acceptable, culturally accepted method of child discipline in the classroom and also in the home. Um, it is technically illegal, however, it does happen, and this will undoubtedly be super difficult for many volunteers to deal with. Um, just to state, the World Teach policy expects that as a volunteer, of course, you never hit a child. And for us as perhaps North Americans or wherever we're coming from in the world, it's probably not our cultural norm, but in some countries it is. So on that note, I wanted to open up to Drew. I wanted to hear perhaps your experience. You know, did you witness corporal punishment um, in the school or in the community? And if so, how did you deal with that? Um, yes, um, it is. Uh, I dealt with it a lot. Um, I saw it happen a lot, um, and it was certainly very um, much a struggle for me at first. Um, I knew it was going to happen, but the first time it did, I had uh, referred a student um, to the office for being disrespectful and disrupting my class. Um, and about a half hour later, um, the student was brought back to my classroom with um, the truancy officer. And the truancy officer asked me if the student had been giving me problems in class, and I answered yes. And immediately that truancy officer slapped the child across the face with his open palm. Um, and needless to say, when I saw that, I started shaking, was very disturbed, um, and um, faced many challenges in, in trying to deal with it. Um, it's, it's challenging because parents and teachers, especially of the older generation, will tell you that if their child is misbehaving, that you are just simply to hit them and that they will listen to you after you hit them. Um, but obviously, you know, it's not something that we're culturally um, aware of and it, it is a world teach policy not to do so. Um, so it's something you you have sort of have to create, um, I think Quinn and I both tried to create, create a safe space in our classroom. Um, and we would told our, teach, our students very openly that we wouldn't hit them. This is a place where that will not happen. Um, and in some ways, I think our students were very appreciative of that, knowing that, that our classroom was a place where that violence was not going to happen. Um, but it happened all around us. And so you just have to be aware that that sort of um, the behavior is going to happen and people will tell you to do it. Um, and it's almost like you just have to sort of um, agree to disagree. You're going to have different opinions, and you're not going to change um, some people's minds about corporal punishment. They've been using it, and they will continue to use it because it is part of their culture. Um, so it's just it's about finding that balance and creating the space where you know that your where your students know that you're not going to do that because it's not something that you believe in. Fantastic. Thank you. You know, I, I'm lucky to say that I haven't had to experience that personally. Um, so I don't think any of us can really understand until you're in the moment. And I think your reaction and in kind of mental preparation are just, you know, so important. And they will, they will kind of, you know, go with you as the year continues and, and, and you'll, I think, be challenged in ways that you can't even imagine and, and this will probably be something that sticks with you forever and makes everything seem a little bit smaller in comparison. Um, Kalika, do you want to share your experience? Because I think you had a similar experience as a Peace Corps volunteer, correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can share a little bit. It was. I think my reactions were very uh, similar. Um, in that, in in I was in West Africa in Cameroon, and corporal punishment uh, was of course illegal, um, and that's what the government said. But it was practiced in the home, and therefore also practiced at school. Um, and a lot of a lot of teachers and even students they use that as the excuse. Well, you should just beat him. He gets beat at home. Um, and I think for me, what it came down to as well is, um, I, I realized I could necessarily just send people straight sometimes to the truancy officer. Sometimes I knew that it was almost the same as me hitting them um, because I was just sending them to go get hit. Um, but what I also did was I started looking for and, and other volunteers to encourage me to do this, which is key, having that community of volunteers that you can discuss things with. Um, we started to just notice that, that there were certain things that, that maybe the students didn't like and we could kind of use those sorts of things uh, in, in, in a discipline scenario. So my example was in my classroom, I went up and 
and wiped my hand on the chalkboard and got chalk all over my hand and thinking nothing of it, I wiped it on my skirt. Um, and the students in the class were aghast and said, Madame, you can't do that, you're dirty now. And they said, go wash, or, you know, and they were shouting at me and telling me I needed to go and clean up my hands and my skirt. So I thought to myself, well, this seems to be a really big deal. People don't want to be dirtied even with a little bit of white chalk that I can just brush off. Um, and so when students were talking, I would walk up behind them and just on the nape of their neck, on the back of their neck, I would tap, tap with a little bit of a duster um, that I had in my hand and they wouldn't be able to reach it uh, and they would realize immediately that if they were going to go home dirty, then their mom would probably uh, be a little bit mad at them for doing that. So it really kept order in the classroom. You can just find, uh, I think, creative things like that um, as well, ways that your students will respond to some of the discipline in the classroom. And I found too that um, aside from just sending people away, which was my first inclination, the, really the better option was to try to handle it uh, in your classroom. I think you do get some level of respect when you do find a way to discipline the students uh, in a way that, that fits you in your classroom environment. I think when you do tend to send people out for every little thing, um, it does give away some of the, it's, you lose some respect in the classroom. So finding a creative outlet, finding something that you can do that um, that, won't, that won't hurt the students uh, and, and, and won't be corporal punishment, but something that the students may uh, find uh, stops them from talking and at least gives them some attention and they have their eyes on you for that moment in the classroom. So that's what I did. Awesome. <laughs> but again, cultural norms are different. So in American Samoa, there may be different things to look for um, and think ways to, to um, get students to list, listen up. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, let's um, go on to the next question. But if this is something that you guys have further questions about, because it is such um, a big issue, feel free to chat in some questions, bring it up later, reach out to us at, a, at another point, anything. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, Quinn, I'm going to address this question to you. It's a little bit lighter than the previous one. Um, what was the level of English amongst the students and the teachers that you were um, working with in the school? Sure. Um, I'll talk about the students first. Um, because you're, the uh, program is looking for English instructors specifically at the high school level, chances are is you're going to be too teaching two different levels of English, um, proficient and mainstream. And I taught both for juniors, junior level students. Um, the big difference is that students in mainstream levels of English are definitely lower. Um, this doesn't mean that they don't know English. It just means that te you have to learn to teach them in different ways than you would necessarily talk with students who are possibly in the proficient level, which proficient level are students that are that are almost completely fluent in English and it's very easy to carry on a conversation with them. Um, obviously there's always going to be challenges and they're not going to know every single word and, and how to do certain things, but it's definitely easier to carry on a longer and more in-depth conversation with students that are in proficient levels. Um, but I think the really great thing about this is that you get to you get to revamp your, your lesson plans. And so you're not just writing one lesson plan. You're working with students that are, whose English levels are, are different. And so you have to figure out creative ways to reach both of those levels of students, which I, which I actually really enjoyed because the students learn differently because of their English levels. So that was, I actually really enjoyed that. And I would assume that um, many of the upcoming English teachers will also be teaching both proficient and mainstream level students. Um, and I definitely think it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge. And it taught me a lot about teaching in general. And, um, you know, that teaching is difficult, but you can find creative ways to make it work so you can reach out to every single student that you teach. Um, in regards to teachers, I think I view teachers very similar, similarly as I would with the students. Some teachers are completely fluent in English and maybe had spent some time living outside of outside of American Samoa. So they are completely fluent in English and you can have conversations about anything with them. But then there's also teachers who hardly know any English at all. Some some instructors on um, our high school campus 
uh, could not speak English, and it was it was just difficult to to use them as a resource or to talk to them about anything, just because simply they just could not speak or were not comfortable speaking English, which which makes sense why they're now requiring the teachers to take the practice. So I think it really it really differs. Um, all of the English teachers um, within your schools will definitely be able to be great resources for you because they do speak English. So I think it really depends on where you're teaching and who um, who the teachers are and what backgrounds they have, whether in school or just in general with English. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, okay, next question. Drew, because you were the field director, um, I know that you oversaw all the volunteers and got a glimpse into each school placement. On average, what were the classroom resources like? Um, it, it, that's not an easy question, unfortunately, <laughs> because um, schools, uh, schools and classrooms vary very differently. Um, some class, some classrooms um, only have one set of textbooks, um, so you can't give your textbooks out to your students to take home with them because they're simply not enough. Um, some ha then some schools or some classrooms will have two hundred textbooks, so you're able to do that. Um, um, sometimes chalk is hard to come by. Um, people, um, your school should provide them for you, provide it for you, but sometimes they run out and they don't didn't get the um, order in for the next batch. Um, that also pertains to um, paper and um, toner for the copy machine. I think Quinn and I can both remember numerous of times where we would get an email or a message from our, our office saying that we can't make copies because the toner is out and they're not sure when the next toner is coming in. Um, toner isn't very expensive, they're hard to order. Um, so we would get you know messages saying, oh, you have to write your tests on the board because we, we don't have enough paper or enough toner for everyone to print their exams for the students. Um, so you would have to figure out how to write your test on the board and that would be how you would give it to them. Um, as far as other resources, they really are, it's really slim. Um, there is a there is one um, store on island, on the main island of Tutuila. Um, it's a teacher store essentially that you can buy paper, colored paper, some other resources, dictionaries, maps and such. Um, but most um, most school, that's not provided for you. That You have to spend that on, you have to spend your own money to get those resources. So definitely the resources are super limited. Um, as um, Brooke has sort of in inferred, um, the internet also is very spotty, as you know, Isaac is having trouble um, joining this webinar. Um, so sometimes your internet will be down and you just you can't do anything. So if you have a lesson plan that you're relying on the internet, um, it may just not work for a couple hours until um, the technicians get around to fixing it. So you really have to be flexible and prepare for the basics, you know, teaching your students um, with you just standing up there and the resources that you have in your classroom. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's, um, it comes back to the, the attitude of being flexible, and I think that's just a value of World Teach volunteers across the globe. Um, I experienced the same thing in, in Colombia, and I cannot tell you any time, really, that a test was given on paper. It was always put on the board. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's another world that we are being invited into, and you won't understand these things until you experience it. You're for yourself, and it's, it's, I think, very important for us to realize that simple classroom resources do not exist the way that they do, perhaps, where you studied. Um, okay, so... Let's see. We are going to go on unless... Um, oh, I just got a message from Isaac, our field director. He actually is in response to resources. So he says he's teaching U.S. history with no textbooks at all. Very challenging. Yes, that's a really good example. Thank you, Isaac, for sharing. And, you know, it... These challenges are what make us successful as volunteers, as teachers, as individuals. I think this makes everything a little bit easier afterwards, and it makes your dedication and your service so much more genuine because you're really being pushed to the limit, and yet there is so much reward in it. So thank you all, you guys, for, for sharing your, your responses. Okay, let's go forward into 
living in American Samoa. Um, I think this is something that a lot of people have been looking forward to, and I know that a lot of the questions um, usually come back to, well, where will I be living, and what will my normal daily life be like outside of class? So this is what we're going to talk about now. Okay, so living in American Samoa. I think I have the pronunciation correct, Tutuila and Manua, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so this is where our volunteers are placed on the, these two islands. Drew, would you be able to quickly compare these two, um, these two islands for us? Sure. Um, Tutuila is the main island. Um, that's where most of the high schools are, most of the people live. Um, on the islands of Manua, which is actually made up of three separate islands, um, there are about 400 inhabitants on those four, three islands, um, and there are no... There, um, it's much different because there's a couple schools, but uh, the stores are very limited. Um, the boat can break, break down for a couple months, and so things aren't sent over. Um, it's much more, if you're looking for an experience of, of a more rural, um, a more getting a real sense of the Samoan culture and the Samoan community, then Manua is where that will happen. On Tutuila, that's where the McDonald's is. Um, that's where offices are. There's more cars. There's buses. Um, so it's sort of like, not, the, by any, not by any means is Tutuila a city, but it's sort of, if you want to compare, it's between city and country living, the two islands. Um, Manua doesn't have a bus. You're hitchhiking or walking everywhere. Um, so that's just basic the basic differences between the two. Fantastic. Um, and just so you guys know, after you've been accepted into the program or after you've confirmed and you're ready to go forward, that's when you fill out this whole preference form stating, you know, what sort of environment you want to be living in and teaching in, whether you want a rural community or you want more of an urban setting, if you want to be teaching um, older kids or younger kids, in this case, we're, we're only in high schools. But this is your opportunity to fill out all of those preferences because the field directors work to place you where they think you will be most successful um, and happiest. So th while those two islands are very different, people go to where where their personality best fits in. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, now, Drew, could you also give us a bit of an overview of volunteer housing placements in terms of roommates, privacy, amenities, landlords? I know that's a big question, um, but again, as a field director, you saw a bit of the variety, and I imagine there are different sorts of, of housing placements. Sure. Um, it, it, there is a variety. Um, most, of the, most of the housing on Tutuila is probably a little bit more up to American standards than the housing in Manua. Um, but most, um, I mean, you're always provided a bed, a dresser, a kitchen table. Um, some housing um, some housing will have more. Um, some housing will have you, you can have access to your landlord's internet. Um, you might have uh, access to a washer and dryer. Um, you're always, you, I'm not sure if it's changed, but you will be living with another World Teach volunteer. Um, sometimes you'll be living five minutes from your school. Sometimes you'll be a half hour bus ride from the school. Um, it's sometimes your volunteers will provide, or your, I'm sorry, your host family will provide you with um, utilities. I mean, uh, like kitchen appliances and stuff like that. Sometimes you have to go out and purchase your own. Um, it really depends on the housing um, that is provided. Um, what I will say is that um, your the host families, well, you don't directly live with them. Sometimes you are part of their, their compound or their property, um, and some want to involve you in every aspect of their lives and really want to bring you into the family, and then some will leave you alone and only um, you know be around if you need them. Um, so it can really depend on what you're looking at, looking for from them, but they will certainly always invite you to come to church with them, as church is a mainstay of the community down there, um, and you are always welcome to join them. Uh, food is always a, a big thing, so sometimes you'll come home and you'll find a, a, basket, a basket of papaya on your table um, from your landlord. Um, so it, it is, um, it is uh, it, there is a variety, but really it, it's what you want to make of it. If you want to have a great relationship with your housing um, family, then you certainly can. Um, it's just what you want to make of it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of commute, and I bring that up because I think that that's, uh, it's very important. I wanted to hear, Quinn, perhaps what your daily commute was like and how much it cost you, if it was easy, etc. 
Sure, yeah. Um, I actually really enjoyed my commute. I taught at Leone High School, which was technically like a rural um, a rural village in high school on Tutuila. And I lived about a 20-minute walk from campus. So I literally just walked just to and from school every day, which I really, really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's different for everyone no matter where you are. Other people on Tutuila took a bus to get to school. Some people rode with other teachers um, or hitchhiked. It's really just different. Um, no matter where you live. Manua is a little bit differently. Um, depending upon which island you live on, you could either you know, have to walk 30 to 45 minutes to school or you could get rides from people. So it really just depends on where you are. Um, I was close enough that I never really needed to get rides and I really enjoyed the walk. Um, so it really, it really truly depends where you're placed and how close you live to the school. But Great. no matter what, um, any form of commute is great, whether you're walking or riding the bus or with other people. Great. And I bring this up just because this year um, we've had some volunteers commenting on the cost of their commute to school if they have to take a bus, and it's between a dollar and two dollars each way. And so while that might add up, you could say that that's going to be five or ten dollars a week. Um, that is something that, you know, is budgeted into your, you have to budget into your monthly stipend. And some people, like you said, could be closer to school and that's very lucky for them and other people, um, you know, have to add a little bit more expense into it. And unfortunately, that is the case with our volunteers across the globe. We have placements that are just so different and varied by school, by host family, by housing, by commute, everything. Um, So just something more to consider. Okay, Quinn, next question. Um, We would love to hear about, you know, what your average weekend was like or sort of uh, extracurricular activities that you got involved in. You know, what made your life outside of the classroom? Because obviously you're there as a person and not just a teacher. Sure. Um, I actually really, really enjoyed the weekends. Um, I was really big into being outside and going hiking. Um, So my roommate and I would always try to go to a different place every weekend. Um, There's lots of available hiking on the island, um, lots of swimming, obviously, because you're right next to the ocean, and just in general, lots of exploring. Um, In villages nearby where I lived, some friends and I would usually go and play with a lot of the children that lived in the area. We would throw frisbees or play soccer or go swimming with them. So it's also, the weekend is a really great time to become part of your local community and um, just, you know, spend time playing with the children and getting to know people. Um, besides besides just general um, outdoor activities and things like that, a lot of people do go to church. Um, one of my friends joins the local soccer team. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of options for getting involved in your community and doing activities on the weekends. You can go out, out to eat at one of the local restaurants. Um, you're never not going to be bored there. Um, as Drew already mentioned, the internet is spotty, so you have to find ways to make it enjoyable, and getting out of the house is a, is a really, really good idea, and exploring the island and, and seeing as much as you can in the short time that you're there. Fantastic. And because I was in Colombia last year, I always got a lot of questions about safety. Um, did you feel safe most of the time when you were out and about doing all of these activities? Absolutely. I I honestly can't even think of one time that I didn't feel safe. And I I was I was even comfortable walking to and from our laundry mat, which was about a ten minute house a ten minute walk from our from our house and I was comfortable walking that way at nighttime. So I never I never felt uneasy. I always felt safe. People are always outside and they're very friendly. Um, so I was never worried. Okay, very good to know. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Um, last note there, as you can see, monthly stipend is approximately $400. And I simply say use it wisely use it wisely it's actually much more money than a lot of our volunteers across the the globe and our other country programs get Um, but of course you know (laughs) the check always runs out right so it's uh, it's definitely budgeting time Um, 
All right, so we're gonna go on to our question and answer session. And at this time, if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to raise your electronic hand. Um, if anyone has any inquiries that they want to voice out loud, or you can send in your questions via chat. Um, and in the meantime, we'll start with some that we've already got here. Um, let's see, and also just to let you know, the pictures that we're going to be showing are they've been taken by our World Teach American Samoa volunteers over the last couple years. So we have pictures of schools, students, scenery to give you a little taste of the experience in American Samoa. So we will go ahead and start with the first question. Um, I'll direct this to Quinn. So after finishing orientation, did you feel prepared in the classroom at the beginning? And as you know, it's absolutely okay if you didn't. How did you feel at the very beginning? <laughs> um, actually, this is this is a really great question. Um, as you might have figured out from earlier, Drew was actually my field director, and um, orientation was really the highlight of my year. Um, it was three weeks long. Um, it was very interactive. I learned so much about the culture and about teaching and about the language in such a, a short amount of time, but it was really, really fun, and I made some really great friends just from that short three weeks, and I absolutely I mean, it's hard to learn how to be a teacher in three weeks, but it's possible, and it's it's you're constantly going to improve learning how to be a teacher, and it doesn't really happen until you're actually in the classroom. Um, but one of the highlights was we actually had to do teaching demonstrations in front of our the other teachers, and I think maybe a few people from the community came in, and that was really, really great practice of being able to actually practice a lesson plan in front of a group of students. Um, so that was really helpful and I hope that they still do that because I really enjoyed that and that really um, gave me a good introduction as to what it would be like to actually teach the Samoan students. Um, but orientation is really great. Um, it's really good bonding time. Eventually you are going to be ready to actually go out to your placements, but it's a lot of fun and you get to do a lot of fun things and take a language class. There's just so many good things that I have to say about it. Fantastic. And I would have to agree, um, orientation is something that we pride ourselves on here at World Teach, and I would say it's the number one reason why I personally felt so confident and comfortable when I first landed in Columbia, and it's the reason why I'm here today still representing the organization, because they truly support the volunteers from the moment they arrive in country. And in response to what you mentioned about the teaching practicum, we do still do that, and it is very important. I absolutely agree. And it's it's the first moment when you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? How am I going to teach? And you go through these emotions where, of course, you're very overwhelmed. But then when you have that first moment of when the students are actually comprehending you and smiling and enjoying it and just being kind of thrilled by your presence, that's when you realize like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm going to be a teacher. And then you'll have a day that is tough. And then the next day you go in and, and then you succeed and you're like, okay, this is it. It's going to be an emotional coaster, roller coaster, but, but I'm going to do this. So yes, a teaching practicum is very, very important. Great. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Um, Drew, this is for our foodies out there. Can you tell us what the food is like in American Samoa? Um, this is actually an interesting question for me because I went to American Samoa as a vegetarian um, and that is not an easy diet to sustain in American Samoa. Um, um, being that it is a small island in the middle of the ocean, a lot of the food is shipped in from New Zealand, Fiji, and the mainland. Um, so it's a lot of um, processed canned uh, meats. Um, Tuna, um, um, corned beef hash are huge um, staples of the Samoan diet. Um, a lot of a lot of traditional Samoan food is very heavy, uh, very with a lot of coconut cream, um, and so it's not always. It's usually a challenge for some volunteers to adapt their uh, their appetites and palates um, to the food in American Samoa, um, but. Um, it's, it can be a great learning experience to see the kind of food that they enjoy, the food they kind of eat. Um, if you go to an umu, which is a traditional um, 
Samoan feast. Um, there are there will be you know roasted pig. There will be uh, kulasami, which is a traditional dish that is sort of like a spinach filled of uh, coconut cream. Um, as you can see this picture right now, uh, Rex is husking a coconut. Um, the coconut water is great there as well. Um, so if you are a vegetarian or someone who has dietary restrictions, it can be a little bit more challenging. Um, that's certainly doable. Um, your local stores do not, do not always have the best produce, um, so sometimes you don't feel like you're getting enough vegetables, um, but you can be creative to find ways to do that. And then sometimes your stores will run out of basic products and you'll have to survive as well. I remember two years ago when I was there, all the stores on the island ran out of mayonnaise. Um, and that is a huge deal for Samoans because mayonnaise is included in many of their foods um, and it was took, took a couple of weeks before the shipment of mayonnaise arrived um, so if some ingredients like that you'll you'll have them a lot of the time and then that will be that time where you don't have them um, but I think if you're up for it and you're adventurous trying the Samoan food is a great idea and uh, um, food is centered in so many of their community events, family or family gatherings, um, people will always offer you food and it can be rude sometimes to turn it down because you don't think it looks good or it's too weird. Um, so it's best to always just accept the food and if you choose not to eat it, that's one thing, um, but certainly um, you should be up for trying it if that's what you're looking for. Fantastic. It, uh, it makes me want to try some random new foods. I miss that challenge of living in another country um, where everything, a trip to a grocery store, is, is a huge cultural learning experience. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, Okay, before we move on to this next question I have here, I just got a, um, a chatted in question from Chris, and he was wondering about how people from outside of the U.S. get to American Samoa if our departure city is, of course, in the U.S. So, very good question. Um, from the funding money that we get, we will give you essentially the allotted money that goes towards transportation. We will give you that money to book your flight um, from wherever you are in the world. So we have people joining us from Australia and they'll be flying directly there because obviously it doesn't make sense for them to go from Australia to America to American Samoa. So yes, that is definitely something that can be done. So thank you, Chris, for, um, for reaching out with that question. Okay, next question, and we're just about almost done. So, Quinn, um, did you feel that your students were engaged and interested in learning English? And what did you do if they weren't? Um, I think it's definitely hit or miss, as it, just as it would be here in the States. Um, most of my students were actually really excited. They're, ar they're already excited that someone, that someone um, outside of American Samoa is going to be their teacher, specifically a World Teach volunteer. So that alone is, is exciting for them. Um, but I, I tried really, really, really hard to be creative in the classroom with my lesson plans and activities and things like that because I know a lot of the Samoan teachers aren't and the students pretty much do the same thing. You're, you're, you know, every year within history classes or science classes or things like that. So I knew that I wanted to make my year in, at Leone very different for them. Um, so really finding ways to be creative and to step outside of the normal box um, is really, really going to bring your students um, it's going to grab their attention and they're actually going to want to be there. Um, I, I did a really big unit on poetry in my classroom and my students absolutely loved it. We made little books and we learned about the different styles of poetry and then we had a big creative day at the end where they actually got to decorate their books and read them and it was just a really, really different um, different type of project than they had done before. So I, I truly believe that finding creative ways already, your resources are going to be very slim, so finding unique ways to grab their attention, um, doing things that they're not used to, which you'll, you'll figure that out um, once you actually get into your school is really, really important and it's definitely going to keep your students' attention while they're while they're in your classroom. Awesome, fantastic, and I agree. It's really just, you know, that's teaching wherever you are in the world with any subject that you're teaching. Um, great, okay, now we have time for one last question. Drew, as a field director and as a volunteer, I feel like you'll be able to answer this very well. Um, 
So any pre-departure steps or advice that you can offer, whether, you know, mental ideas, physical, um, physical preparation that a future World Teach volunteer can take in order to ensure a successful year in American Samoa? Um, great question. Um, I would say, and something we've talked about already, Brooke, throughout the presentation today, is that um, you really must go to American Samoa with an open mind and with a willingness to be flexible. Um, things change. Um, all the time. Sometimes you will not understand why things have changed, um, but you really have to be able to adapt and go with the flow. Um, for someone, it's a really great experience for someone who's looking to get involved, to try new things, to be out of their comfort zone. I think that was one of the biggest, biggest lessons I learned while I was abroad. It's just be feeling okay to be uncomfortable and not um, not know what was going on. There'll be many times where people will just be speaking Samoan and you won't have the language skills to keep up with them and you're just, you know, you're, but you're still there and you're just enjoying listening to them. Um, this one quick note I will say is that um, volunteers do not need to pack as much food, I mean uh, clothing, as they think they do. Um, I think all volunteers overpack um, and a lot of the clothing you, you might think you want to bring um, might get ruined there because it's so humid. Um, most of the uh, laundry mats do not have hot water for the washing machines. Um, so definitely do not bring things that are leather. Um, bring clothing that you are okay with maybe discarding when you finish your volunteer commitment. Um, but definitely you do not need to pack as much, uh, much much clothing as you think you do. Great. And yes, I would definitely second the, uh, the point on having a flexible attitude. I think that's just, again, it, 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 it goes back to all of our World Teach programs and to our mission. I mean, we are, you know, we're going into these countries where we don't really know anything about their culture. We haven't been part of their community before. And in, in order to really immerse yourself, you have to be flexible and you have to be ready to take on the challenge and and put yourself out there so that the community brings you in. And they absolutely will if you, if you put yourself out there. So, um, so thank you for sharing that. And just a little side note, this is a picture of Isaac, our field director in American Samoa. He's making a beautiful face back there in what Kalika and I would consider to be quite a very nice classroom. Um, look at those lights up there. I would have killed for those lights in Colombia. So I believe that is going to bring us to the end of our presentation, unless anybody has any further questions. And if you do, no worries. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, you have my email address, and also we're going to be able um, we're going to be able to. Oh, look at that! I have a great question. So Chris is wondering if you can take the praxis in American Samoa. Now I know that Drew and Quinn, you guys said that you did take it there. Now normally we do request that people take it. here here in the United States, but this test is not offered outside of the U.S. And for the people that do live outside of the U.S., yes, you can take it once you've arrived in country. Um, and we can go into details on that further in an in a individual conversation. But, um, but you guys did say that you took it in American Samoa, correct? Yes. Yes, we, we did. did. Okay. Um, so now we are trying to push that people take it prior, but it can be done in country, um, and we can we can talk about that further. Um, Drew, do you know about out of out of curiosity how many volunteers took it in country when you guys were there? Um, we all did. It was not a requirement when we were volunteers to take it prior to going. I see. Um, so my year. Um, my year it was just sort of a recommendation that you could take it, so not all of the volunteers did. Uh, for Quinn's year, uh, it sort of, it became, I think that's the first time it was a requirement, but we did it in country, and it was, uh, I think, postponed a couple of times, so it didn't even end up happening until the middle of the year. Um, but if you take it in American Samoa, it is only a paper test, um, and it's only offered about three or four times a year because it's a paper test. Um, so just know that it's a different test than the online versions that you can do 
uh, in the States. Great. Okay. Thank you. That's good to know. So yes, it is now absolutely required because as you can see, it's required for the American Samoa teachers. Um, so therefore, if you are in the States, then it is required. And if you're joining us from another country, then we can speak to you further about taking it in country because you're right, it won't be offered in your country where you currently reside. So thank you, Chris, for that question. Okay. So as I said, we're going to close out, but if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to us here at World Teach. And we're going to send this information to you via email tomorrow, as well as the Praxis document that Kalika had referred to earlier. And you'll be able to, to see this whole video again, if you want, because I know it's super entertaining. Um, and please, any questions, reach out to us. So thank you so much to our panelists and to my co-facilitator, Kalika. We really enjoyed sharing this information with you guys tonight. And, you know, the World Teach is an amazing experience that we are lucky to just share it with you and hopefully you'll be lucky yourselves to actually experience. So best of luck to everyone in the um, application process and, and we'll see you in American Samoa.